Um, hi, everyone. My name is Beth. I'm a librarian here at the Round Rock Public Library. Um, today's topic, as you can see, is Beyond Ancestry Library Resources for Genealogy. So I'm going into this assuming that you've maybe used Ancestry.com or the Ancestry Library Edition. I will very briefly touch on the Ancestry Library Edition, just in case you're not familiar with it, because it is a useful resource. Um, but this is specifically about um, some library databases that you can access from home for free with your Round Rock Library card that can help you figure out your family history and find maybe some of the folks you've hit roadblocks with over the course of your research. And then without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. So um, I said I'm a librarian at the Round Rock Public Library. I'm assuming that all of you are also either patrons or live in the Round Rock area. Um, if not, that's okay. Um, you can access our library databases with a Round Rock Library card. You don't have to be a Round Rock resident as long as you live in the state of Texas you are eligible to get a free card. The only thing is we ask that you come in in person to sign up. So if you are far enough away that that's not possible, another option that you have is to check in with your local library because they likely have at least some of the resources I'm gonna talk about today. But you can also take advantage of the Houston Public Library's digital card, which is called My Link. Um, this is open to any Texas resident for free. It gets you access not only to some of the genealogical resources I'm going to mention, but also to things like Hoopla and Canopy and a bigger Libby collection. Um, so if that's of interest, again, this is free to any Texas resident. You just come to this web page, the houstonlibrary.org slash manage card. And there's a form you'll fill out at the bottom to clarify and verify that you are a Texas resident. Um, and then you'll automatically get the card number and you'll be able to log in and use their resources. And all of that information is going to be in that handout I'll send out later. So um, keep an eye out for that. But um, they have two of the databases I'll talk about. They don't have another one, but they do have a, an alternative. So um, it's a really useful resource to take advantage of if you didn't know about them already. Now, to get to Round Rock Public Library databases, you would want to go to the library's website, roundrocktexas.gov slash library. That gets you here. And then you'll mouse over research near the top of the screen and you can click on research by alphabet. And what that brings you to is an alphabetical list of all of the databases that we have to offer. So for example, if I was looking for ancestry library edition, I could click on A and then scroll down here a little bit farther and there it is. And then I would just click on it and it would open it up. Now you'll notice Ancestry Library Edition specifically is library use only. So you have to be in the building, either sitting at one of our computers or with your device connected to our Wi-Fi, rrtx wi fi um, So it's only useful if you can actually make it to us in person. The other databases I'm gonna talk about today, which are HeritageQuest, Fold3, and newspapers.com are all available from anywhere. So you can get to them no matter what you're doing no matter where you are, as long as you have a Round Rock Library card. Um, when you click on one of those databases, you'll see a screen that'll ask for your library card number and your PIN. Your PIN is the last four numbers of your phone number. You'll enter those and then you should be able to get in. Um, when I go to Heritage Quest and Fold3, you won't see that screen because I'm here in the library already and it knows I'm here. Um, but you sitting at home would need to put in your library card number. Now, I did say I wanted to briefly touch on Ancestry Library Edition, so I'm going to go ahead and open that up. So in case you're not familiar, um, the Library Edition of Ancestry is an, an offshoot of the subscription Ancestry.com website. Um, so this is free to you with a Round Rock Library card as long as you're in the building. Uh, it has about 30% of the Ancestry.com subscription offerings. So if you're familiar with Ancestry, you may already know that they have a US edition and a world edition that you pay more for. So you can either pay to get just the United States records or you can pay to see international records. The nice thing about the library edition is it has 30% of the world edition. So it's got both US and international records. So if you have an Ancestry subscription and you just have the US, you can get to the, some of the world edition stuff by coming into the library. And if you don't have an Ancestry.com subscription at all, you can get to it by coming into the library. Um, there's not as much here as there would be if you paid them, 
but it's something. Um, Ancestry is really sort of one of those foundational genealogical websites. You're going to find vital records, birth records, marriage, death, naturalization, city directories, all kinds of things here um, that can really help you get started. The three other databases I want to mention are where you can go to really dig in to some of these subjects and some of these places and try to break through maybe a couple of the roadblocks that you run into as you dig deeper into your family history. So the first one I want to mention is Heritage Quest Online. This is a spin-off of Ancestry.com. So it's actually giving you access to some of Ancestry's collections from home for free with your library card. Um, this is what the landing page looks like. This is the first thing you'll see when you click on Heritage Quest Online after you've signed in with your library card. You'll notice near the top of the screen, they have an option to search, and I'll show you that in a second. But I also want to show you the research aids and the maps sections. So if I click on research aids, um, these are research guides that ancestry experts have put together. Um, so they talk specifically about census records, they talk about how to kind of get started if you're just starting out. And then they have a couple of deep dives into like cemetery research and researching black ancestors. Um, so there are some resources here if you're just starting out or trying to break through a roadblock, they have some recommendations for you. Back up at the top again, I, there's also this maps option. And if I click on that, um, that takes me to a map of the US. And what this is, is it's a set of historical maps of county and state boundaries that you can use to cross reference with the US Census. So for example, if I click on Texas, I get a timeline along the left side of the screen here. So right now I can see Texas circa 1820. And if I jump to 1860, it'll show me the county boundaries and the state boundaries as of 1860. And then if I scroll down a little bit farther underneath the image here, we get a little bit more of a description and a little bit of background um, on the Texas censuses. So this is useful if you're looking at the US census in 1850, your family's living here, and then all of a sudden in 1860, you can't find them. They may be in a different county because things have moved around over time. So you could come here and say, oh, well, all right, I was looking in that county because that's where they lived 10 years ago but really they're in the same place, but it's in a different county now. So this is a useful resource as well. Getting back to where we were, I'm gonna jump back to the home page, which you can always do by clicking home in the top left corner. You'll see right here on this first screen, they have some quick links to some of their collections. And then at the bottom of the screen, they have even more quick links to some of their collections. So Heritage Quest is really best known for having access to the US census. Uh, it covers um, the censuses in the US from 1790 to 1950. So it does include the most recent census that was just released this year. Um, but it also has family history books, city directories, um, the pension files and bounty land applications for Revolutionary War records, Canadian censuses, and then at the top of here, we've got the city directories again. The census map guide is the same link as here, this map section. Um, they have census rolls from when the US government did a census of the Native Americans living here. Um, bank records from the US Freedmen's Bank, which is actually a pretty interesting uh, collection. Sorry, I clicked on that by accident. Let me get back to where I was. Oh. Um, the Freedmen's Bank, and then we have these mortality and agriculture and, and industrial schedules. Um, and these are a deeper dive. When they did the 1850 through the 1880 censuses, they included these expanded schedules where they asked more in-depth questions about people who had died that year, people who worked in the agricultural and the industrial um, fields. Um, so if you're looking for even more information about your ancestors and they're in here, this is one way to find it. Now, this is just what they prioritize. This is what they show you right off the bat. But if you click on search, this is actually surprisingly where you can see the whole set of options that you have to access in Heritage Quest. So we've got public records, we have the Social Security Death Index. Again, there's those Revolutionary War pensions. 
Um, they have the find a grave indexes, which you can go on findagrave.com for free. So that's not super useful, but it's here. And then all the way at the bottom, we also have access to some maps and photographs as well as international records. So if I click on any of these, like UK and Irish, I can then see the limited collections that they have from the UK and Ireland. And I could click into one of these collections um, to see more about it and to search within it. So they hide a lot of this stuff behind this search button. And then you can click into any of these collections to dig into it and see more about it. So if you were going to search for a specific person, you would click on search, and then you have to decide what kind of record you think they might be located in. Um, so you might have to do multiple different searches. That's why I say that Ancestry is the foundational place, and this is really where you go to dig in. So hopefully you have somebody in mind and you're really looking for like a specific kind of record for them. That is what this is going to give you. Um, so if you're missing a will or you're trying to figure out a death date, you could come in here to the wills and probate record. If you're just trying to track someone and where they moved across the US, you might look at the census um, and on and on. And even if you're if you're doing uh, uh, research into some Black American ancestors that you have. Um, the Freedmen's Bank was a bank that specifically served uh, folks who had been emancipated after the Civil War. Um, so Black Americans that wouldn't necessarily show up in the census record or, or in other records, but that would be here because they were working with the bank to try to reestablish their lives um, after being freed from being enslaved. Um, the other thing, when you click on a particular collection, so if I click on the Freedmen's Bank collection here, the very first screen I see is a search form. So I can search within that collection. So I could put in someone's name. Over here on the right side of the screen, I also have the option to browse. So I could click on this drop down menu and say, I want to look at the dividend payment record from 1882 to 1889 for the Freedmen's Bank. And then I can dig in and actually look at scanned pages from the dividend records in these locations. So if I think I have an ancestor who lived in Charleston and I want to see if they were part of the Freedmen's Bank, I could click in here um, and actually see those records. I will do that in a moment, but before I click away from this screen, I also want to point out that if you come down to the bottom, it will give you a description of not just this collection, but also the kinds of information you can find and how you might be able to use that information to verify and clarify where a, an ancestor was, what they were doing and, and how it's useful to you. Um, including a, a collection and context section where they explain the history of some of these groups and some of these organizations. So lots of information in here. Now, when I search for someone, Let's, let's say I want to search for John Smith. The search page is going to be pretty familiar to those of you who've used Ancestry.com before because it's basically exactly the same. So on the left side of the screen, I can choose to broaden or narrow um, my, uh, my name search. I can say I want a broad spelling of John or I want a very exact spelling of John. Maybe I know exactly how it was spelled. But as we all know, as genealogists, it's not impossible to know exactly how something was spelled because everybody did things differently. Um, you can also click on view record by any of these records, by any of these results to be taken to a transcript of that record. And then from here, you could print the transcript, you could email the transcript to yourself, and you can click on the image to see the actual scanned document. And then from here, you can click on the arrows to go back and forth through the rest of that record. You can click save up at the top to email it to yourself or to save it to the computer so you can print it out. Similarly, when you browse within that collection, if I go back to that search screen we saw, so I clicked on the dividend payment record. Um, let's go ahead and do the index to deposit ledgers. And I'm gonna choose 1872. When you browse, you are taken to a screen that looks a lot like what we just saw when I viewed that record. So I can actually toggle through this whole book because it's been scanned in page by page by page and try to see if my ancestor is here. So if, as always, if you do the search and you don't find any results, but you think you know that they're here and you think you know when they would have been in the book, 
or in this particular record or in another collection, you can really drill down and try to find them there. And then as always, you can click save up here and send the image home by email or save it to print it out. Okay, all right. So next up um, is fold three and fold three might be a familiar name to you. Um, it is also owned by the same company that owns Ancestry.com. Um, unlike the Ancestry Library Edition though, the Library Edition of Fold 3 has all of the same materials in it and all of the same records in it as the subscription version. So you can access this at home with your library card, it's free to you, and you can get to everything that someone who's paying for it can also get to, which is very, very nice. Fold 3 is best known for military records, and that's reflected in a lot of their collections. They have a lot of United States records, as well as a few from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, basically the, the Commonwealth, quote unquote. Um, but they also have some materials, especially from the National Archives, that aren't specific to the military. Uh, so I wanted to point those out as well. Um, just like on Heritage Quest, if you wanted to search for someone specific, you could do that either by clicking search at the top of the screen or by clicking into the search bar and typing in a name. And I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. But if you're looking to browse, there's a couple different ways to do it. You can click browse at the top of the screen. And you can also right here on the home page, choose a country and then click on a particular collection to kind of dive in and see what's there. So I have the United States selected and I could click into the War of 1812 and see what records they have that are associated with that particular conflict. I could also click on the United Kingdom. And interestingly enough, they have a French Revolution set of records. They have a set of records about the Boxer Rebellion, um, a few different things. So you could click in here and see more about these as well. You can also, if you scroll down to the bottom of the screen, you can browse specifically military records according to the conflict that they're associated with. So if you know you have multiple ancestors who served in World War I in the UK and in the US, you can view the World War I records and search within them by choosing that particular conflict. Now, when you choose a, a set of records to browse through, let's say I wanna to go to the United States, um, I'm going to choose not a military set. Let's choose specifically the non-military collection. So I'm going to click through here. The first screen you'll see is a little overview of what is in this collection and what sorts of things you can expect to find here. They have some featured publications that you can click through. You can search within this particular collection by typing a name or a record type or whatever you're looking for into this white search bar and clicking the magnifying glass. And you can also click on a description to just like in Heritage Quest, get a, an in-depth explanation of what you can expect to find here and how it might be useful. Um, so they have uh, records about black Americans, Native Americans, homestead records, things from the Boston Library, naturalization records, lots of different uh, records that you might not have guessed were here on Fold3 since everybody, we all think of it as a military archive. And then you can also click on publications and that will give you an alphabetical list of all of the sort of sub collections within this topic. Um, so for example, I have the collection about the American Colonization Society, which was responsible for founding Liberia. Um, there's an anti-slavery manuscripts collection. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of collections here um, and just kind of hidden if you don't know what you're looking for. But if I click on one of these collections, one of these publications as they call them, um, again, I get taken to an overview page. Uh, so I can click into the search bar up here to search specifically inside this publication. I also get a description and I can click description to get a more in-depth history of this particular society or this particular collection or, or publication, depending on what I'm looking at. Um, and I can also near the top of the screen here, click browse and kind of dig down into this collection. So let's say if I, I'm in the American Colonization Society, I wanna look at their financial papers for whatever reason, I can click on that. And then they have it broken out by the types of financial papers. 
So let's say I wanna see some receipts and then I can filter by the date. And then I actually get the scanned documents and I can scroll through or click on any of these pages to see that document in full. And just like on Heritage Quest, I can use the arrow keys to toggle back and forth through this document, searching for names. And then I can save or print the document by clicking on the little wrench in the top right corner here, clicking print to print or download to download. And you can not only download the entire page, but you can also download or print a part of the page. So if you just find a little blurb about your ancestor in one specific section, you can just save that or print that. You don't have to print the whole thing. Now, when you search for folks on Fold3, you come to a similar screen. So let's go ahead and click on search. Um, so I could type in a particular name up here at the top. Let's say John Smith again, and we'll click the magnifying glass. And I get 1.7 million results. So I have lots of options on the left side of the screen to narrow down what I'm looking for. Maybe I'm looking for someone who fought in a particular conflict. Maybe I remember, oh, there, I saw they had that non-military title collection. I'm not looking for military records, so I can narrow it down to just non-military records. I can narrow by location, by the name of a particular publication, if it's from a newspaper or a city directory, a type, a record type content provider, lots of different filters that I can use to narrow this down. And then if I wanna go ahead and look at a particular record, I could click on it and I would be taken in to see the actual scan. Um, some of them do have transcriptions, but most of them are just the scans um, and you can then read it for yourself. Um, and as always, if you wanna save or print it, you would mouse over the wrench in the top right corner and say download or print to save it. So that is fold three. Does anybody have any questions about that before I move on to newspapers.com? Okay. So the last collection, the last library database that I wanna show you that you again might be familiar with is newspapers.com. Um, so newspapers.com, just like Ancestry, just like Fold3 is a subscription service. Um, the regular subscription service off offers about 800 million pages of newspapers and they offer about 22,000 titles whereas the library edition offers about 19,000 titles but only 200,000 pages so it's almost the same number of titles but there's fewer pages on offer here um, it's only about a quarter of what you would get from the subscription this is really their way of getting you in the door so that then they can say oh you want to see the rest of this paper cool pay us money um, but you do have you have the access for free through us. We've, we've, we've gotten as much as we can for you. So um, when you go to newspapers.com, you'll land here on the homepage. Uh, you can do a search right here by putting in a keyword or a name, and then you have the option of adding a date or a range and a location. You can also search by clicking search in the top left corner. Um, you can browse for items in the newspaper collection by clicking on browse. Oops, let me get back to where I was, there we go. Once you click on browse, um, you'll be able to dig in by location, either by choosing it from the list or by clicking on map. Um, so you can see they have a few different countries listed here, not a ton. Uh, most of what's in here in, the, in this library edition is from the United States. Um, so I could choose the US, maybe I wanna go down to the state of Texas. And then I get, I am prompted to choose a town, say Austin. And I do have some access to the Austin American Statesman, which if I click on it, they give me a few years here that I can then click on like 1893. And I could see the issues that they have in each of these months. So March 1st, 1893, for example. Um, once you click on a particular issue, then you get a list of pages that you can look at and you can then mouse around those pages, click between them, just like we saw on Fold3, just like we saw on Heritage Quest. You can also select using the map. So they have a world map. You would then click on a particular country or a particular location to again, drill down into the specific place that you wanna see. Um, this also gives you the option to search. So from the map, I could type in Texas and click search. 
and it would try to get me some options, but it's not very good at it from there. It's not the best place to search from, but it does, it kind of, it tries, it tries its best. We'll say that. The other option you have when it comes to browsing, the seeing what's here and, and trying to dig in and find folks without having to search for them is to click papers near the top left corner of the screen. And that will take you to, again, we've got about almost 20,000 papers in here. Um, so it'll take you to an alphabetical list of the papers that are available through this database. Um, on the left side of the screen, you can narrow it by the title of the newspaper if you know it. You can also narrow it down by the dates. And then if we scroll down a little bit farther, you can choose the location that it's based in. So I could click on Texas, I could click on world and choose a country um, and use that to narrow down my options. Once you find a paper that you're interested in looking at, and there was one in particular I wanted to show you. So the Abendblatt, which is German, but it was based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, you can see it tells me how many pages are available, it tells me the time frame that it was available. And if I click on it, I can search within that specific paper. I can also see some sample pages and I can browse the paper by the date. So I could change the year here, change the month and choose a particular day and click in and see March 29th, for example. So let's actually do that now. So I clicked on March 29th. And this is what the viewer looks like. So anytime you search within the newspapers, anytime you browse within papers the way we saw on the other screen or here, um, you'll ultimately get to a scan of the document. And then you can toggle around within that page and look for names um, when you're searching. And I'll show you that in just a moment. And actually, I can actually give you an example here. If I search for John Smith, it's not going to come up. But it will try to search for that name and then it would highlight it in yellow and I could jump to that spot on the page. Um, that is based on optical imaging. It's based on the AI doing its best to read the document itself and figure out what it says. So it might not always be accurate. If you do a search for John Smith and you're pretty certain John Smith lived in that area at that time and, and you're looking for his obituary, flip through the pages, scan and see if you can find him because just because the website tells you he's not here doesn't mean he actually isn't. John Smith is not a very common German name, so I'm not surprised I don't see him there. Yeah, the, I just, uh, there's another question in the chat. Is the optical character recognition software good slash accurate? It does a fair job. Um, I will show you the search in a second so you can see exactly what it does. Um, it, it does its best. It's better than it used to be. It used to be really pretty bad at finding people by their names. Um, and it has gotten better. So it's, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's worth a shot. And then, then if you don't find what you're looking for, and you're pretty certain that they should be somewhere in this paper or possibly somewhere in this paper, it's still worth looking yourself to see if you can track them down, if that makes sense. Um, as ever, there are arrow keys at the bottom of the screen here, so I could toggle to the second page of this issue or farther on, depending on what I wanted to see. And then if I wanted to save a particular page, I could say print slash download. And just like on Fold3, I can either do the whole page or I can do a clipping, a portion of the page, and actually choose, say, this particular article to clip down. And then I could either print it out or I could save it as an image file, a JPEG, or a PDF. Um, those will be saved to your computer. So you would then have to either email them to yourself if you're working off site or put them on a flash drive. But if you're at home, you can just save them to your computer and then they're there. Now that's browsing. I, I do wanna go back and go ahead and do a search. So let's look for John Smith again. Um, I'm gonna see if he is mentioned in a newspaper from 1890 to 1900 in Texas. And I'll click search. And it's going to think about it. And so when you do a search, these, this is what the result screen looks like. And what it tries to do is pick out where that name is in that particular paper. So I have a match for the Galveston Daily News, page 19 of the Sunday, April 5th, 1891 issue. 
And at a glance, my guess is that this isn't actually relevant because it's in quotes. It's probably from a like a story, a short story that was published in the paper, but I could still click on the link and get in and then it will jump me to that section on the page. And I can see not only has it flagged John Smith here, but it also flagged John because it remembered, it recognized that that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for John Smith and it's kind of smart enough to know that it must be related. Um, so it does a fairly decent job, especially for relatively generic American English names like John Smith. Um, the more complex you get, the more difficult the spelling is, the worse I would imagine it would be. So, uh, but this is what the experience looks like. And you can see here, it actually highlights him, it highlights that name all across the page. Uh, so he, this is, this is in fact a short story about John Smith, but um, if I was looking for an obituary about that person or, or an article about that person and something that happened to them, um, it would tell me everywhere on the page that it thinks he's mentioned. And then just like before, I can toggle between multiple pages here. Up at the top, I can also toggle between the matches. So if I jump forward far enough, man, there's a lot of matches here. It'll show me all of the matches on the page for that name. So I can try to see and make sure that I'm getting the right thing. And then as ever, I can click print slash download to save or print either the entire page or a clipping, um, depending on what I need. Does that, does that help? Does that answer your question about the OCR, hopefully? Um, does anybody have any questions about newspapers.com? Okay, well, um, that is my spiel. Um, again, you can always email me, elamp at roundrocktexas.gov. Uh, my phone number will be in the handout if you'd prefer to call me. I think that's gonna be it. All right, thank you very much for coming. I hope that this was helpful. And if you have more questions, just get in touch with me. Thank you.